Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're about a minute from the top of the hour, so I'm going to allow some time for everyone to join us from the lobby, and then we'll get started right at 2, uh, 2 p.m. Central Time. Thank you. I'm going to add a survey question to my webinar because at the end of the at the end of every webinar we send out a survey. And I'm going to add a question for everyone. I want to know if we need to have some music or something here. It feel, it always feels quiet. Okay. Still some people in the lobby. All right, everyone. Well, I still see a couple people joining us from the lobby, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the Rural Health Executive Educational Series. I am Cody Smith, Partnership Manager with NRHA Services Corporation, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today. Before we dive in, I do want to note there is a short survey at the end of the session, and your feedback is invaluable in helping us to refine and tailor our future educational series to best serve your needs. So if you could please take a few minutes at the end to complete that, I would truly appreciate it. And I'd also like to review a few housekeeping items. Um, first, all attendees are muted during the session to avoid background noise. We do aim to wrap up the presentation in about 45 minutes to allow some time for a Q&A session at the end. If you do have a question for the presenter during the webinar, please go ahead and type it into the question section of your webinar control panel at any time, and we'll be sure to address it at the end. I'd also like to remind you that the event is being recorded, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording later today. So today we have the privilege of hearing from Jeff Summer, Managing Director, and Claire Kelly, Senior Consultant of Stroudwater Associates. Jeff and Claire are presenting what critical access hospitals should know about partnerships. Before we begin, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to our dedicated partner, Stroudwater Associates. We are so grateful for your continued support and industry expertise, which allows us to host conferences and educational webinars such as this. Your support is crucial to our mission of advancing rural health initiatives. And not only do our partners share their knowledge and expertise with us, but they play a very significant role in supporting NRHA's efforts on Capitol Hill. Your advocacy and support are essential to our ability to influence policy and secure funding for rural health care programs. So once again, we thank Stroudwater Associates for their ongoing support, and we are so honored to have you as a partner in our mission to improve rural health care. All right, that's enough from me. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jeff and Claire for our feature presentation. Terrific. Thank you so much, Cody. Um, we're delighted to be here and thank NRHA for providing this, this really important platform. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Claire and I have been working with rural health systems and rural hospitals around the country on issues of strategy and also um, partnerships and affiliations. And we wanted to share with you some of the the findings. You can see our contact information, so should you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, in terms of how we approach um, the question of partnerships uh, in general, it, it's really important to um, emphasize the role that operating results, operating performance plays. Um, there is, is no strategic option available that is not reliant in some way upon um, sustainable operational performance. Um, and so one of the things we, we do when we're working with an organization in a on a strategy question or in terms of evaluating partnership options or um, uh, re-envisioning a partnership is to really look at the organization's risk profile to define the strategic options that are available to the organization. How likely is it that um, uh, performance improvement or operational performance improvement needs to be the first thing that occurs before uh, the organization wants to actually even begin uh, discussions with prospective partners in any way? Um, we really want to identify gaps and have a plan that an organization can be working on. So, Having a credible plan and showing progress in terms of operating and performance improvement is essential for any strategic option, but certainly for the conversations that you may want to have either with an existing partner or a prospective partner. And so that really gets to kind of the, the strategic options in, in a nutshell, which is 
it's perfectly legitimate and in fact in many instances might be preferred to focus on an independent strategic option with a focus on operational performance improvement to achieve that sustainable viable level of performance going forward another option you may have an existing partnership maybe it's a limited partnership maybe it's a, actually a more strategic partnership but it's no longer working as well as it should and the idea of revisiting aspects of it to try to tune it up and make it reflect uh, the needs of both entities so that uh, the actual operating performance can be improved and the strategic value created uh, enhanced is a really important uh, component. And then lastly, whether it's a focused clinical partnership or something more comprehensive and strategic, the idea of looking at new partnerships and how does operational performance and operational performance improvement factor into that, those are all a component of, of our uh, framework as we look at these issues. So we just wanted to do a level set there. Um, our agenda today is to, to provide some background on key industry trends and factors that are driving a lot of the interest and activity in partnerships. And then we wanna help um, leaders of rural health systems, specifically critical access hospitals, understand when they should be thinking about partnerships, how to ensure that that partnership creates value regardless of the nature of the partnership. And then lastly, to avoid some of the pitfalls that we find often undermine the potential value of a partnership uh, and can destroy value for, in this case, critical access hospital. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Claire, who's gonna do some of the industry trends that form a backdrop for this conversation. Thanks, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. As Jeff said, my name is Claire Kelly. I'm a senior consultant with Stradwater, and we're going to talk a little bit about some health industry factors that we're seeing nationally that are driving consolidation and partnerships. So Stradwater looked at the top three rating agencies, which would be Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor's, or S&P. These rating agencies publish not-for-profit healthcare outlooks on a biannual basis. And in December of 2022 and July of 2023, the outlooks across all three of these rating agencies were deteriorating or negative, mostly due to labor shortages, compressed margins, and frankly, a lack of operating cash flow. Fitch even went so far as to say that they projected that more hospitals and health systems were expected to pursue mergers and affiliations given the difficulty of, of the healthcare landscape. Now, because we're in December, some of these outlooks have been updated for, for 2024 in the past couple days or so. So I wanted to provide an update there. Fitch for 2024 projected a deteriorating outlook. It's still at deteriorating, again, due to labor shortages and compressed margins. S&P detected or released for 2024 outlook for not-for-profit hospitals that, again, it would still be a negative view for that sector while hospitals are wrestling with operating costs and revenue challenges and actually moody's updated their 2024 outlook from negative to stable as they're anticipating a 10 to 20 percent increase in the sector's median operating cash flow for next year so a bit more of a mixed bag than last year but still leaning towards that that negative outlook some statistics that support this negative outlook as we look at days cash on hand, operating margin, or maximum annual debt service coverage ratio for the past few years, you can see that from 2020 to 2022, those have all been deteriorating. And then we can look at revenue and expense growth trends where there's been a 17.2% increase, increase in total operating expenses and a 12.5% increase in net patient revenue. So again, when you have expenses out, pacing revenue, that's going to lead to those compressed margins that we're seeing and hearing about. Looking at the 2023 mid-year statistics, um, you can see that we have this chart here that shows favorable versus unfavorable sector outlook revisions. And that's for the past decade where the dark blue would be favorable outlooks and the light blue is unfavorable outlooks. Compared to 2021, we can see how that ratio has shifted towards unfavorable outlooks for 2022 and 2023. 
It should be noted that 2023 is partial year. It's through June 30th of 2023. But the key point here is that it's really an inverse ratio and it's the, the, the smallest ratio for favorable on this chart for the past decade. So how is this negative healthcare outlook impacting industry consolidation? So what are our catalysts? Margin pressure, which we've talked about, you have a staffing crisis and provider shortages. And what this is actually doing is leading to more provider burnout. Jeff and I had a conversation with a CEO who is the head of a, a large critical access hospital that's highly profitable um, and in the past and is in a, a lovely located, is located in a lovely area and in the past has never really had to worry about uh, staff burnout or recruiting providers to their area and is now starting to have to face that dilemma a bit. They're having trouble recruiting providers and frankly they're having folks that are leaving the organization just because they can't keep up with demand. So it's folks that haven't been experiencing that staff burnout that are really starting to post COVID have that affect their, their bottom line. And we also like to talk about economies of skill and what we mean by economies of skill is the ability to recruit and retain folks that really understand healthcare at your organization. If you're a rural organization, it's recruiting and retaining individuals that understand the minutia of rural healthcare and, and keeping those folks at your organization. So these catalysts are helping drive the 985 hospital affiliations that have taken place since 2012. And if you look at the top chart here from 2020 to 2022, you see that affiliations start to drop off. There's not as many um, in 2021 and 2022 as there were previously. However, that bottom chart depicts the annual, the average party size in terms of annual revenue. So the smaller party that's involved in an affiliation has really increased in terms of their annual revenue from 2019 through 2022. So what this is telling us is that although there are less affiliations, there are affiliations between larger entities. An example of this would be Kaiser Permanente and Geisinger, their affiliation. So time is never a neutral factor. You'll hear Jeff and I say this a few times through this webinar, and it's something that we at Stradwater tend to, tend to talk about a lot. And what we mean by this is that if you're a stressed organization or even a stable organization that's heading towards stressed, it's really important to make timely, effective, and informed decisions. And the longer you take to make a decision, whether that's to pursue a performance improvement plan or to pursue a partner, um, that can have a, have a drastic effect on your strategic value. Um, from this chart, you can see that your strategic value really peaks when your operating results are good and positive, and that if your operating results start to deteriorate, so does your strategic value. Additionally, the longer it takes to make a decision about um, strategic components at your organization, the more susceptible you are to market developments. A great example of this is COVID-19. Um, no one really, really saw that coming. So that disrupted a lot of partnerships <clears throat> that were in process during that time. Another development that Jeff and I have had happen is a lawsuit coming up in the middle of a proposed partnership. So again, making sure you're not making uninformed decisions, but informed, effective decisions. And our last thing that we really want to talk about is what we're seeing coming from the federal government, which is increased regulatory scrutiny for large hospital transitions and, and acquisitions. And a couple of ex examples here in Memphis, Tennessee, Methodist Lebanon backed out of a bid to buy two tenant owned hospitals after pushback from the Federal Trade Commission. We saw a similar situation in New Jersey between Hackensack Meridian and Englewood Health. That deal fell through after the Federal Trade Commission challenged that deal. And actually in New Hampshire, most recently, the New Hampshire Attorney General objected to a proposed merger between Dartmouth Health and Granite One Health. Granite One um, was a system of two critical access hospitals and a PPS hospital. And the New Hampshire Attorney General objected because in, in their purview, it violated the states to constitution that requires free and fair competition in the trades and industries. 
Additionally, President Biden has issued an executive order calling for federal agencies to take a closer look at the impacts of mergers. So we're definitely seeing a lot more pushback from the Federal Trade Commission. What does that mean in terms of partnership? What it means is that it's really important that you demonstrate in contractual terms the value a partnership can bring between either your proposed partner or if you're in an existing partnership. It's being able to demonstrate that in contractual terms and showing the value that you can bring to your community, that it's sustaining healthcare in your community, and that's outlined in the deal terms specifically. And Claire, the only thing I would add, the, the comment at the bottom, there's a lot of scrutiny and, and there has a track record going back, you know, more than a decade of the FTC and the attorneys general looking at affiliations and where one or both parties um, uh, document that one of the key drivers is to try to get contract leverage relative to payers, that that has been a basis for unwinding or um, uh, not approving uh, affiliations. And, and, and certainly in the current regulatory environment, that scrutiny is uh, even, even greater. So it's really essential uh, if you are either in an existing uh, partnership where the payer contracting um, authority is at the combined entity or you're contemplating entering into a partnership that would have the level of, of integration and uh, uh, risk, operating risk um, shared where it would enable a common contracting approach that that rationale not be documented or not be uh, referenced uh, in the discussions um, because that can literally uh, force uh, a, a disapproval or unwinding of a, a partnership. Um, so one of the questions is, is, you know, we often get is uh, when sh should we think about uh, partnering? And um, the, the short answer or perhaps cheeky answer is um, when you don't have to partner. And again, however you define uh, partnering, whether it's a focused clinical or some other arrangement that's not, doesn't involve uh, governance control or assumption of operating risk, or on the other hand, something more strategic that does involve uh, uh, giving up some, some local control uh, in return for uh, commitments around services or investment, either way, those conversations are more fruitful and more productive if they occur in an environment where one or both parties don't have to be having the conversation. Uh, and so the reference there goes back to, the, I think the first slide we talked about, the role that operational performance plays in informing strategic options. So you want, you want a partnership discussion to be something that you're, you're doing because you believe it will create value for the organization and your community and be something that is sustainable for both parties. Uh, an example of how uh, something that Claire touched on earlier where timing is not a neutral factor, um, Claire and I were working with a, a strong rural uh, uh, PPS system, prospective payment system. This is a community hospital. Um, its big issue was that it, it was facing major capital investment concerns. Its entire facility was was extremely dated, and they'd done some minor updates uh, in recent decades, but really were facing a significant constraint there. Um, previously, they had allied their entire multi-specialty group with um, a um, large academic uh, system that had a strong track record of operating multi-specialty groups. So in essence, they already had a partnership in place. This was an existing partnership, and um, what they were concerned about was increasing competition uh, and the, the sheer magnitude of the investment they'd be required to do. On the flip side, they felt um, you know, somewhat concerned about loss of control and what this might mean for their local delivery system. Um, but they, they had been successful in building and sustaining their local medical staff and medical community. Um, but that relationship with their medical staff meant that any other partner was, was really a non-starter. They only had one option in front of this, them. So uh, we, we helped them negotiate a uh, affiliation agreement that addressed 
substantially all of their requirements and objectives, including a $25 million capital infusion. And this was probably three or four years ago, it was pre-pandemic. Um, and um, the uh, partner had entered into, while these deliberations were ongoing and the board was taking its time, had entered into another number of other commitments and had its own operational challenges. And as a result, this board was not able to exercise the deal that was in front of them and the partner pulled back on their capital commitment. Otherwise, the arrangement was unchanged. Um, the, um, our client, the rural affiliate, ultimately did go ahead with this affiliation, but they did so without the $25 million capital commitment. So in this case, that delay cost $25 million in terms of uh, what that partnership could bring. Understanding the risks, one of the fundamental things that Claire and I would, would hope everyone would take away from this webinar is that a standalone organization has inherent operating risk, and that can be mitigated by improving operational performance. Um, an organization that's looking to partner, again, whether it's just a, a focused, limited partnership or something more strategic, is going to invite partner risk into the equation. And so what you hopefully are doing by bringing a partner to the table is mitigating some of the existing operating risk your organization faces because they can bring clinical expertise and resources to a clinical affiliation or capital to a tighter affiliation, for instance. But that partner risk is something that it's really important to focus on and try to minimize, but there's always some that remains. So the time-tested, proven approach that we use has four elements to it. One is uh, process. You want to have a well-structured process. Ideally, it's competitive. You have more than one option coming to the table. Um, that checks all the fiduciary boxes that the board needs, but also enables you to negotiate and play uh, prospective partners off against one another, even if one of those prospective partners is a preferred partner. It's just a good um, approach to use to ensuring that your objectives are met. You want a strategically aligned partner, somebody who understands your value, both existing value and future potential value, and is willing to invest to create value in you. You want to look at the track record of alternative partners to make sure they do what they say and their track record backs up their words. Um, it's really important to get the affiliation structure right. Does the structure allow this partnership to address the key objectives, maybe mitigate some constraints that you're facing, or does the structure preclude that? You'd be surprised how many times either this get is, is, is gotten wrong at the start or requires some fine tuning after the fact, and sometimes well after the fact as circumstances change. You also want to make sure you have contractually enforceable terms. Uh, without that, it's the agreement is is significantly diminished in value and protections as and as a a, a vehicle for mitigating partner risk. Um, so those are are really important elements. Certainly communication and certainly coming at this with the mindset. Even if you have some operational performance issues and maybe you're stressed, and we'll get into that definition in a minute. You want to make candidates earn the right to be your partner, because often there's significant residual strategic value that you're bringing to the table, especially as a CA affiliate. And that strategic value is often not fully understood. So speaking a little bit about uh, stress, and what we're talking about here is financial and operational stress. And you, you can see moving from um, uh, right to left, uh, we go from a stable organization with, with sound margins and um, positive cash flow um, and growing top line revenue to, as you move towards stressed, um, seeing some erosion of market share, perhaps seeing um, some deterioration in key operating financial and strategic indicators. Maybe there's an erosion of, of margins. Uh, maybe top line revenue is flat, not for an extended period of time, but those start to suggest that they, not everything is well 
And as you get into two or more years of declining margins, two or more years of declining or flat top line revenue, that's where you start getting into the stressed area, which re will require significant change in direction and trend to alleviate deterioration of, of the, the hospital or organization's market position and strategic value. As you move into distressed, you really start talking about um, three years or more of declining negative margins, three years or more of flat or declining uh, top line revenue. This is when an organization is really in um, um, uh, defense mode and frankly retrenching. And as for a critical access hospital to be cost cutting, you're also, for every dollar you take out of cost, you may be removing 50 cents in revenue, depending upon the total ratio of, of cost-based payment. So it's a, th th this is where cost-based payment becomes a two-edged sword. So you're, you're uh, really better off, A, not sliding all the way to distressed, but also looking at growth strategies as you think about this continuum. The interplay of organizational stress and distress to uh, underlying operating risk and strategic risk, and in the case of partnerships, deal risk is an important one. And so what you can see here is that for a distressed organization, every risk factor is elevated. Operating risk is elevated, strategic risk is elevated, and deal risk is elevated because you have so little leverage to select a preferred partner one that's strategically aligned, to negotiate terms that are contractually enforceable and favorable, uh, you're really, at this point, looking for a lifeline. And as the old saying goes, beggars can't be choosers. Choosers, you really want to avoid this scenario. In the stress scenario, you have more uh, leeway. If you've got a, an operational performance improvement plan and you're working that plan, that's important. That sends the message that this isn't um, a, a really uh, challenging situation. This is an organization that has uh, intrinsic strategic value and is working a plan to preserve that value. Um, but you still have elevated strategic risk and deal risk remains somewhat elevated because your ability to negotiate everything you want may be a little compromised. So, um, and there is that residual deal risk or partner risk that, that is always present. For a stable organization, you have much lower operating risk, much lower strategic risk, and you still have some residual deal or partner risk. And, and um, this suggests that for stable organizations, partnering may be, in terms of a risk profile, maybe less of an attractive option. Uh, that being said, um, you want to, to have a partnership discussion when you don't have to have the partner discussion. So you certainly want to do it before you've uh, perhaps eroded into a distressed uh, position. So somewhere um, perhaps as stable becomes stressed and before stressed becomes distressed is probably um, um, the sweet spot in terms of being able to mitigate operating risk, develop an operational improvement plan, and using the, the early returns of that plan perhaps negotiate a partnership. But again, it's certainly reasonable. And if you've got a credible plan and you're working that plan and making par uh, progress on it, whatever partnership you could be discussing could be very limited and focused in terms of maybe a key clinical area or some other area, as opposed to a larger strategic um, uh, full scale uh, partnership or affiliation. Claire and I, over a number of years, have developed this strategic risk uh, framework, and really it has four uh, parts that, that risk vectors that all interact. You, of course, have financial risk and operating risk. Those two things are very much related and can uh, exacerbate one another. But to that, we would add value risk, which is really that interplay between cost and quality. What is your cost position? How do you perform on quality metrics? Are you in a position where you can manage the risk uh, of, a, of a population and participate effectively in alternative payment models uh, and, and population health initiatives? Market risk is driven by your market position, 
and consumer preferences and demographic trends. So sometimes, completely outside of your control, you may have an industry or a major employer that decides to relocate. And there's nothing you could do about that, but that can be a significant driver of market risk for an organization, everything else being, being the same. These, these items do have, have interaction with one another. And in the case of a, a significant change in the employment base within a service area, that often spills over into financial risk, which then creates additional operating risk. Um, so the, the cumulative effect and the interplay between these is important to keep your eye on. One of the things we believe is best practice is to, to monitor strategic risk and look at longer trends, at least five years of key metrics, top line revenue growth and others that are important in the overall risk profile of the organization. This gets into just more detail about specific risk factors and the various tools or approaches for mitigating those risk factors. Fairly self-explanatory. Um, certainly, if any of you have concerns about um, uh, any of these risk vectors and, and specific initiatives or approaches that might be helpful in mitigating them, that's something we can discuss offline if, if helpful and just be a sounding board to you uh, as to maybe where to prioritize certain things. So the, the next um, section is how to be sure that your partnership creates value. And um, one of the things that Claire and I have found, and this is true for hospitals and health systems that have a complicated governance structure, perhaps they're they're county owned, but leased by a 501c3, or they're hospital district owned and have a similar lease structure with an, a, a third party 501c3 operator, is um, making sure that there is good communication, good understanding and trust. And those tools are just as relevant for, uh, you know, a, a more standard governance model where you have a board and you have management, you have medical staff, and other key stakeholders. And so this is really just about ensuring that uh, there's good fundamentals that are followed. One of the things that we would say is you, you wanna have folks using the same facts when they're deliberating and making decisions and that they have a good comprehensive set of objective facts for that. You wanna make sure that you pull together stakeholders from different groups to engage around major questions about the future strategic options of the local delivery system, and that there's a shared vision of what the future should be. Um, that tends to pull people together, and, and just as having a common fact base is essential, having that, that common vision for where people wanna go is really, really important. And then regardless of what the, whether the, the initiative is focused on performance uh, improvement and operational turnaround, or a limited partnership or perhaps a larger, more strategic partnership, having an effective and proactive communication strategy is essential. And as we said all along, making sure that we keep a focus on operational performance is essential. So good, good uh, background on some of the key building blocks. This um, uh, slide gives a really nice overview of some of the structures a huge amount of variation and variability, both between different structure types, but even within structures. And so one of the things we would say is really important to understand the specifics behind any of these structures. Generally speaking, as you move to the right, those are more integrated, uh, more coordinated. And we like to say you have um, a, a greater potential for partnership to create value because you have that greater integration and coordination, but you also have the greater potential for partner risk. It can be much more disruptive um, to an organization. So on the left-hand side, perhaps uh, less disruptive potential, less potential for additional value, but also less potential for partner risk to destroy value for, for either organization. Um, one of the things that's essential in selecting a structure, uh, 
is, nope, you had it right there, I'm sorry, is um, understanding the value levers and um, what it is that, that makes sense and resonates and is attractive to both uh, uh, parties around the affiliation. What are their objectives? What are their constraints that they're trying to address? What are some of the organizational needs that, that the partnership needs to address? And for rural health systems, and specifically cause, cost-based payment is a big um, opportunity. And it's something that larger uh, partners may not understand. And our experience is, frankly, that, that many um, partners out there, larger health systems, um, don't understand cost-based payment and don't make decisions keeping that in mind. So one of the things in terms of the lever cost report optimization, I would equate this as it's the equivalent of uh, tax planning versus tax filing. So submitting a cost report is like tax filing. Cost report optimization is making sure that you're making the right decisions uh, that are favorable for your organization and are permitted, um, but that help you improve or increase cost-based payment. And so just like tax planning can reduce your tax burden, good cost report planning and optimization can enhance cost-based payment as well. Home office allocation, both making sure that that is maximized uh, to the allowable amount, but also in terms of how the system treats that home office allocation and the allocated costs. Um, you don't want to allocate those costs and treat them as if they're all incremental costs as opposed to an allowed reallocation of overhead with maybe a, a small fraction of which might be actual incremental costs. And, and understanding how that then can be um, distorting for how folks interpret critical access hospital performance within a system if you're in one of those larger, more comprehensive strategic partnerships. Certainly access to 340B program and a pharmacy strategy is key. Swing beds, rural health clinics, all of those are levers and there's some more there listed that are important. As we think then about the continuum of structures, um, what's important to note on the next slide is that um, as you move to the right, you will see more um, alignment and more access to some of those letter levers. What basically the test becomes um, as it relates to the home office allocation is that the system needs to be risk bearing, both assuming operating and financial risk for the affiliate to be able to qualify for that home office allocation. And then there's some other components to that as well. Um, so again, I mentioned that that continuum of, of alignment, that continuum of potential value creation, but also uh, potential partner risk as you move from the left to the right. One of the things I wanna make before we move, move on uh, to the next slide is that even some of the structures to the left over time can create additional partner risk and significant switching costs. So management agreements are a popular way to try on a, a uh, relationship for size. Uh, it doesn't involve shared governance, uh, doesn't involve commingling of assets, um, but over time, what can happen under management agreement is for very valid business reasons. There can be a offshoring of core business functions to the manager, and those services can be purchased uh, under the management agreement. But at the end of the day, via that process, you end up with a, uh, an affiliate that has a bunch of hollowed out and no longer has the capacity to do certain core business functions. So if a decision was made to want to exit that management agreement, the organization would either need to stand up all those functions on its own or find another partner to fill in those gaps. So something to keep your mind on as you think about risks and rewards of, of different structures, one of the upsides of a management agreement is that economies of skill concept that Claire mentioned earlier, management agreement can really help a rural organization access key expertise it doesn't have access to on its own. So some food for thought there. So as Jeff referenced earlier, we know that partnering is, is not a risk-free endeavor. And this goes for whether you're looking at prospective partners or whether you're in an existing partnership. So 
what are some ways you can start to mitigate that risk and and really make sure that you're doing your best to to not put your organization at a greater risk than it needs to be so if you're looking at a prospective partner it's really important that you vet and select a strategically aligned partner an individual or an organization that will be within your strategic objectives that you've outlined getting to what Jeff just talked about, an affiliation structure that fits with your strategic objectives and allows you to take advantage of some of those value levers, making sure that the value levers that you may have outlined, the affiliation structure that you may have outlined are in contractually enforceable terms. We've encountered and seen some unsuccessful affiliations where you know, leadership has promised, quote unquote, that they'll keep certain services for a certain length of time, but that's not reflected in the deal terms. And frankly, leadership changes over, people leave positions, and those promises end up being broken. So it's extremely important that your contract really reflects what you're, you're, you, you want in terms of your strategic objectives. And then looking at their track record, as Jeff has referenced earlier, if you're a rural organization and critical access hospital, do they understand rural? Can you call their previous affiliates and ask, you know, hey, how did their track record hold up, you know, after you affiliated? Did they meet your expectations? Did they do what they said they would? If you're in an existing partnership, it's important to make sure your partner, again, understands your rural value. And if they don't understand your rural value, are they open to having discussions? Are they open to being educated and, and learning about the value that's being left on the table? Does your affiliation structure provide the value that you want for both parties? Are there opportunities that you can quantify that have been missed, such as a home office cost allocation or 340B or, or swing bed? So, you know, those are all key things for existing partners, but how do you really begin to start having these, these conversations? These are strategic, important conversations. So one of the things that Jeff and I like to suggest is to get some early wins on the board and build confidence and trust and buy-in with your existing partner. And that can be done a couple of different ways, but really we like to look at, okay, what are things that are low cost to implement? What has a quick ROI? Do you have the ability to, to execute? Do you have staff availability to, to, to execute these, these initiatives? And do they fit within your strategic plan? Do they fit with the strategic opportunities that, that you've outlined? So a couple examples would be, you know, swing bed and 340B are relatively low cost to implement and have a relatively quick ROI. Um, home office cost and the cost report typically have a little bit more nuance to it. Um, based on, on some outside factors, um, but you can do an interim cost report, but that's really up to the discretion of your Medicare administrative contractor, but you can do one in the, the middle of the year. So what about for folks that are looking for, for new partners? So it's really important in this scenario that you have individual partners and organizations compete for the privilege of being your partner. You need to run a competitive process. It allows you to do a couple things. So you can have multiple people at the table, you have leverage. If you're going one-on-one -on -one to each organization, they know they're the only partner at the table and you lose a little bit of leverage. Where if it's a closed process and you have multiple people or multiple organizations and other organizations don't know who's in it and they've all signed NDAs, that allows you to have a little bit more leverage. It allows you to gather more information about your partners and options. It allows you to educate your prospective partners about your value and then allows them to adjust their proposals or terms and commitments to reflect what they've learned about your value and to show that they're understanding and learning the rural value that you can bring to the table. And again, assessing that track record, making sure that they have um, are respected with their rural affiliates. And finally, the most important thing is do not sign a letter of intent until you have an acceptable term sheet in hand. Again, make sure you have contractually enforceable terms that really reflect exactly what you want from your partner um, and do not sign anything until you have those in your hand. So Jeff and I um, had the pleasure with working with a critical access hospital um, and they were projected to have a negative cash balance within two years. They're about an $18 million organization. 
and they are projected to, to really have a negative cash balance in two years. And so their board elected to run a preferred partner process. Through that process, Stroudwater, you know, when we were looking at prospective partners, was able to quantify and estimate the value the critical access hospital could bring to each partner using the different value levers that, that Jeff reflected on. Our client ended up going with a prospective partner and was able to fund its required investments and demonstrate it was able to fund its required investments and increase operating performance by about 670K annually. So because we were able to show that our client found a prospective partner, their the prospective partner submitted a, a LOI and they came to contractually enforceable terms and an LOI was signed. And as of last week, both boards have, have approved the, the affiliation to move forward. So a really great, great day for, for healthcare and sustaining healthcare in that community moving forward. And this is really showing how we demonstrated that value to these prospective partners. So in the top left, you'll see performance improvement initiatives. And here is where we estimated the annual, annual estimate for each, each of these value levers. So for swing bed, for 340B, for a cost report. And then we gave a low estimate for the home office cost allocation and a high estimate. So total savings on the low side was about 1 million, where total savings on the high side was about 1.3. And remember that this is an $18 million organization. So one to 1.3 million to 18 million is, is not inconsequential. Their required investment over five years was about 3.5, and we assumed 100% debt financing and cost reimbursement of about 40%. So <clears throat> when you look at our projections, on the low estimation side, you see the net change in operating performance never drops below 670K. So again, showing that they can be sustainable through this affiliation structure, through taking advantage of these value levers, the potential partner was able to see this understand the value that they could bring to the table and then restructured frankly their proposal to reflect reflect the appropriate terms our organization was looking for and i'll let jeff kick us off with some other key case studies and that really exemplify some some pitfalls and how we can avoid them thank thank you claire uh the first one is really um one of the more compelling um examples from from my perspective the um two organizations were brought together um not not by stroudwater one had uh, lots of leverage and a fair amount of cash okay amount of cash the other one had no leverage but no cash so they individually they were undercapitalized they were combined um together under a joint operating agreement uh, which combined two undercapitalized uh, rural health systems into one large undercapitalized rural health system. Uh, so they, they selected a structure and both of them selected a partner that didn't mitigate their underlying strategic and operating risks. And the structure didn't, didn't do anything to change that. In fact, because of some operational challenges right out of the gate, they weren't able to get some early wins under their belt. And as a result, um, both entities, their medical staffs, their, their legacy boards became quite resentful of the other uh, party. And the way the joint operating agreement was structured, the organization that lost more money received a check from the organization that lost less money. And you can understand why that uh, was not really workable even in the, the short term. Um, so the challenge for them, though, was that they were on the distressed, stressed uh, kind of boundary, and both of them needed needed to be recapitalized. But there was such uh, animosity and distrust. They one of them just was, I don't care. I we want out, and we'll sue to get out. And I don't care if it drives the other one into bankruptcy. Um, we were concerned and brought in at that point with this kind of failed system to try to find a solution, and we were able to find a partner and a process to essentially recapitalize both organizations separately and allow them to continue, uh, ironically, with the same partner, but with separate affiliations with the same partner. So this gets back to the structure is important, the partner is important, and understanding what your needs and constraints are uh, is critical and making sure you get it right. And in this case, they got it wrong. 
So another client that Jeff and I had, we were brought in by a critical access hospital who had a preferred partner already identified, but the partnership process was stalled and it became very apparent quite quickly that their preferred partner, which was a large regional referral center, didn't understand the, the rural value of a critical access hospital as part of a, a larger system in their region. So per our recommendation, we suggested, you know, that they kind of go back to square one and that the client, our client run a competitive process to evaluate a broader selection of, of partners. During that process, we educated all parties involved, including the previously selected partner on the unique value proposition of having a critical access hospital as part of your system. However, you know, despite our efforts, the, the former prospective partner didn't update their proposal, showed that they really were not, were not interested in, in changing their, their proposal. However, an alternative preferred partner, because we ran a, ran a competitive process, emerged, and this preferred partner had extensive experience with rural hospitals. They had a great stellar track record with turnarounds of critical access hospitals, and they a lot of experience in rural. So our client was able to go with their newly identified partner who not only had expertise on rural and a valid track record, but they submitted, you know, a, a proposal that met the, the quality and strategic objectives of, of our client. So uh, ended up being a, a great day for them in their community. Another example of where a competitive, not running a competitive process really, really failed an organization was we were retained by a critical access hospital who again had already selected a preferred partner. Unfortunately, our client prior to us working for them had approached other partners in their area, other organizations, and were negotiating one-on-one. -on -one. So this was the third organization in their area that they had approached. And of course, you know, leadership at all these organizations talk. So the third organization that they were speaking with knew that they had already talked to two others and that those hadn't come to, to, to fruition. So it really impacted our clients' leverage with, with negotiations. So without a competitive process, our client could not get their preferred partner of choice um, to confirm, to, to, to commit to strong capital commitments and firm deal terms. Um, so that was an unfortunate situation. And this is an example where we were assisting a critical access hospital that was talking with a large and sophisticated national system that actually had uh, four or so critical access hospitals in its network. And um, the initial proposal made was really inadequate, um, even though the, the system saw the strategic value of this critical access hospital to one of its existing regions that it operated in. And you know, as we dug into where, where was the the dissonance between the value that we we identified and what the system was saying, there was about a $3 million swing in terms of the home office allocation uh, that we conservatively estimated about $3 million annually, and they were placing a $100,000 value on that. Um, and this organization had a larger than 50% share of cost-based payments, so very attractive uh, in terms of future operating results and clearly had the ability to um, create um, um, good system referral integrity and increase our referral volumes from the critical access hospitals market. And conservatively, if we said it was 2.5 percentage points of market share, that would have significant ROI. Well, we went through this process of educating and, and discussing these factors with the system. The end result was they they did significantly modify their proposal uh, from a very modest capital commitment with no local control to one that included major investment commitments, major service commitments, and a significant continuing uh, local role in governance, which was much more attractive and aligned with the objectives of our clients. So um, this is an example of where the dialogue and the education and quantifying your value uh, can can really realize rewards as it as it uh, uh, revolves around a, a relationship or a partnership discussion. 
So we want to leave you with some takeaways. And one of them is operational performance is foundational to any strategic option, whether that's continued sustainability as an independent organization, whether that's investigating a limited partnership or revising an existing partnership or whether that's doing a major strategic partnership that's new and creates significant alignment. Operating performance results are essential for that. And, and if you're stressed, it, it will preserve cash, lengthen the runway that you have to operate and find the right strategic option, and it'll improve your value proposition going forward, which is critical. Another one is time is never a neutral factor. Again, don't kick the can down the road. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Make informed, efficient decisions to, to prevent putting your organization at, at further risk. And knowing your value, doing the homework, quantifying it and sharing it in a compelling way with prospective partners really is essential because it's, it's not that they're uh, blind to your value. It's that they have a very complicated world they're operating in. They may not know rural as well as you do. They may not know critical access hospitals as well as you do. And all the very various value levers you have to create value as a member uh, or as a, a clinical partner um, going forward. So understanding those value levers, quantifying them and communicating them is key understanding that there are no risk-free strategic options that quote, goes for maintaining a status quo that comes with an inherent risk you have operation risk operational risk and you have partner risk and it's really about how can you evaluate how to mitigate some of those risks as you move forward with your strategic choices those are the key things to remember and we talked about there being no risk-free option claire just mentioned it when we think about partner risk, which is anytime you're in a partnership, there's gonna be residual partner risk. Well, how do you mitigate that? One is by running a process that has multiple options where possible uh, so that you can vet and evaluate and negotiate from a competitively advantageous standpoint, the terms of that partnership. Um, selecting a strategically aligned partner that has a track record of doing what they say and creating value in their critical access hospital affiliates is important. Look at their track record. Uh, getting the structure right. We've shared some examples of what can happen if you get the structure wrong. If you're, one of your major needs and one of your major constraints is that you're undercapitalized and you need capital to do some sort of a, a major investment project, that's gonna dictate um, what type of a structure, what type of a partner, uh, and what type of, of terms you want to include. Um, lastly, I would say the terms. Contractually enforceable terms are critical. And if you follow these, these four points, the likelihood that you have um, some of the pitfalls that we've discussed um, and the distraction and cost of having to completely redo an affiliation or exit a partnership is greatly reduced or that you're disappointed in the value that is realized by your community and organization from a partnership, whether again, it be a clinical partnership or a limited one or something more strategic. So those are the key uh, lessons and framework we would leave with you. Uh, we invite your questions both now, uh, there's only a few minutes left, but also offline. And uh, uh, please feel free to use this as a sounding board as you navigate uh, either help re revising an existing partnership, exploring a new one, whatever that partnership might look like. Great, thank, thank you, you so Paul. much, everyone. Paul. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Jeff. We do Not have a couple all, questions. Um, we, I, I want to go ahead and try to get to these if we can. Um, I'll just start out. The first question is, what experience do you have with partnerships between CAHs and FQHCs working together and thriving in a rural environment? You know, we, we've seen a models where um, the, the, a rural health system and the FQHC work very effectively and collaborate very well in, in a pretty durable model. Uh, some of the, the lessons there is that there is some 
uh, representation on each other's boards. I know FQHCs have specific requirements uh, in terms of board representation, but we actually had have, have an example where um, the CEOs of the respective organizations sit on each other's boards and they have a contractual relationship where the FQHC operates the primary care in that service area. The hospital operates the hospital and the specialty care. That has actually worked very well for that health system. But we, we have seen uh, instances where similarly collaborative uh, relationships go awry and uh, become very um, either competitive and um, um, predatory, if you will. Um, so I, I think proceed carefully, but I think there are examples out there and certainly that relationship, contractual relationship between both organizations in creating some limited uh, governance overlap as is permitted for up to the limits uh, available in FQHC would be two suggestions I would make. Great, thank you. Um, we are at time, so I'm, I'm gonna end here, but I just wanna let everybody know the questions that came in. If we didn't get to them, Jeff and team will absolutely have access to them after the call. And I'll make sure they reach out to you to get you all the information that you are asking for. Jeff, Claire, thank you for the great information. We did have several people ask for slides and the presentation, so I'll make sure you get those requests. Um, as a reminder to everyone, there is a recording link that will come out later this afternoon. I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to take care of that last or take care of the survey at the end. I really appreciate your feedback. Jeff, Claire, any closing remarks? No, I just want to thank you, Cody, and thank everyone for their time today. And again, just to emphasize that uh, Claire and I are available should you have questions and just want to bounce uh, an idea off of us as, as a sounding board. So thank you all. Appreciate your Thanks, attendance. Everyone. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Thank you for the great information, you guys. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you all next time. You as well.